Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Kuringai Library's Deepavali celebration. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we are all joining this webinar. I pay my respects to all elders past and present, and also extend my respect to all First Nations peoples joining us this evening. I am Gayatri Krishnamurti, and I work for Kuringai Library as a librarian. Deepavali is a major festival which is celebrated throughout India. While Indians are celebrating Deepavali, we decided to converse on one of the stories connected with the celebration, the story of Rama, Ramayana. <clears throat> Ramayana, as you may know, is one of uh, the two major Sanskrit epics of ancient India, an important text of Hinduism, the other being Mahabharata. The epic traditionally ascribed to Maharishi Valmiki narrates the life story of Rama, a legendary prince of Ayodhya city in the kingdom of Koshala. Today, we have a group of interesting panelists from different walks of life. And I'm going to ask the panel members to tell us how they connect with the story of Rama and what they think about the story. And I look forward to all your presentations. Thank you for your time today and for joining us today. Um, if you are part of the webinar and not on the panel, I thank you for your time to, jo to join us today. I encourage you to share your thoughts and reflections and questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Your questions will be directed to the panelists for their response. While the panelists will introduce themselves before they present, I would begin by telling you who they are. Can you just wave to the audience when I call your name? The, the first speaker after me would be Dr. Chandrika Subramaniam. She's a lawyer, journalist, speaker, writer, all rolled into one, and also my friend. The second panelist would be Isha Diyota, who works for HelloFresh as a growth manager. She's also a student of Bharatanatyam and is an active member of the Vedanta Center. The third speaker would be Arunas Partiban, who works for Bankers Trust, is also a musician and teaches Indian classical music. She has been my friend, a well-wisher, a guide for several of my artistic ventures, including this panel discussion. Thank you, Aruna. The next will be Ayati, the youngest member of this panel who is studying in Castle Hill High and is also a student of Natya, Bharata Natya. She also learns classical Indian music. We have Badri Ganapati, who is a mechanical engineer at IAC Acoustics. He has learned to play the violin and he has been exposed to classical music and classical dance all his life. His sister is a classical musician and I have seen him grow from a young age. Thank you, Badri. And then we have my colleague, Sita Chatterjee, who's a librarian at Kuringai Library. She's also a student of classical music and is a proud grandmother who's always trying to teach her grandchildren about the culture. Thank you all for your time today. First, before going to our panelists, I'm going to share my thoughts about my connection to this Ramayana. I am a librarian by profession, but I'm also a classical Bharatanatyam dancer. I've been practicing dance all my life and I've been teaching for 30 years. Past 20 years, I've been teaching dance in Australia. As you all may know, Indian classical dance is storytelling and the story of Rama Krishna are very common. I actually cannot remember when I first heard the story of Rama, but remember several conversations with my gurus, the Dhananjayans, who taught me dance. I remember as a young child sitting in, dressed up in the green room before going on stage and just to keep, her, keep us out of mischief, my teacher used to talk to us about the stories and various episodes from Ramayana. So those are fond memories I recollect of Ramayana. And later we did Ramayana as a whole production in Tamil 
by Aruna, written by Aruna Chalakavirayar. And that at that time, I played different roles. And every time my teacher would discuss the character and would also say, what is um, the strength of that character and how it should be depicted in classical dance. So all those growing years, it was a story and it was the character that I was interested in. But later in life, when I think about those morals, actions behind those characters, I believe there are several lessons to be learned from this great story. There are several morals. Maybe that's why we keep telling the story for years, generations to our children and to our grandchildren and we still want to continue to tell these stories. We want to teach them. I think we've had a phrase. So Chandrika, did you want to? Um... Yeah, okay. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, everyone uh, for this wonderful opportunity to reflect on Ramayana. Um, my Ramayana experience uh, started when I was a teenager at 14. It was a punishment given to me because I was not in the class. A poem from Kambaramayana was given to me and the teacher asked me to uh, give the meaning of that. From one word, Sita in S. Janaki, I was able to find, and I was able to narrate the whole meaning, which was a success, successful thing. And then I started getting some interest. I started reading Ramayana when I was in year 11 and 12. But my parents were not allowing me to bring the Ramayana book to my place. They said, oh, you can't do like that. You have to be very religious and do things and stuff. So I started reading it in my school library. Later, when I went to Chennai to do my studies, that was the first Kambaramayanam conference I attended in Chennai, where we had this great scholars like Kiva Jha, you know, talking about Ramayanam the whole day I was sitting and watching, which tri really triggered some interest. Then due to other things, I lost interest and I, I was doing other things. I was writing books and stuff. As a writer, I always looked into Ramayana. I'm in a retiring stage now, so I thought I must translate Ramayana into English. That's why last three years I've been reading a lot and writing and I've translated 108 songs in English of Kamba Ramayana. That gave me a lot of experience where I realized it is an ocean. It has a lot of other things like character, language, grammar, and the righteousness a man should follow in, with a grand picture. Throughout the centuries, Rama's story is found in many languages around the world. Sanskrit alone contains some 25 or more different versions of various types of Ramayana narratives. In particular, in South Asia, different forms of Ramayana are followed, like dance dramas in both classical and folk traditions, and sculptures and bas reliefs, mask plays, puppet plays, and shadow plays, and other performances. However, most of us know that main Ramayana is once writ one written by Valmiki, Kamban, Kritivasa, and Tulsidas versions. These versions make some distinctions by certain aspects of the story and character building. The traditional distinction between Katha story and Kavya story poem can be compared as to English literary works between story and discourse. That is, the story made similar in two of the works but the discourse may be immensely different. Even if the structure and sequence of events may be the same, the style, the details, the tone, the texture may be much different from each other. The best example to illustrate is Rama himself. It, Rama is identified as a superior human being by Valmiki in his Ramayana, whereas Kamban depicted Rama, Raman as God with a mission to release all souls from the world-bound misery. Kamban attempts to enact in detail and with passion his master, the Vaishnavite devotee, Nammalva's vision on drama. He uses different weave, the texture, the colors and descriptions artistically added to Valmiki's work by introducing many changes and highlight the divinity of drama. 
Valmiki made the blueprint, whereas Kamban built a palace on that. Rama is clearly described as a god with a mission dedicated for the welfare of the world. Therefore, Kamban has decorated Rama by highly immersed in religious sensation and theological portrayals. The second is the culture which Valmiki used is a North Indian culture, whereas Kamban used a South Indian culture with his, many of his characters. With this note, let me now let the flow to talk and reflect more on this. Thank you very much. Sorry, because of technical reasons, I had to go away halfway. So um, I would like to continue my reflection. And I was talking about the leadership training in my organization. And I thought of some of the leadership and teamwork lessons that can be learned through Ramayana. I like to give some examples in the Ramayana. Okay? One, first is planning and vision. How the battle between Rama and Ravana was planned. First, Hanuman was sent to check if Sita was safe. Then monkeys are assembled and the bridge was built. And then the battle itself happened. Importance of making allies. Making your partners successful. Before Sukriva could help Rama in his fight against Ravana, Rama had to make Sukriva successful against Wali. This teaches us that our partners can only make us successful when they are successful themselves. <clears throat> Importance of right intent. Even though Rama had no army of his own, he was able to garner a large army to fight against Ravana because his vision and persona were considered righteous by the team behind him. This tells us the importance of right intent in the mind of the project. Looks like we have a present again. I might then do my opening remarks and then hand back over to Guy Triyanti. Um, namaste everyone. My name is Isha, as Guy Triyanti said, and I'm also a student of hers for dance and I'm a growth manager at Hello Fresh. For me, Diwali and Ramayan celebrates the triumph of positive aspects such as kindness and truth over negative aspects such as lies and hatred. And we signify this by lighting lamps during Diwali to illuminate the darkness. I think this theme resonates with people regardless of culture and religion. As a child growing up in Australia, not only did the story of Ramayan help me connect with my cultural heritage, its universal appeal meant that I could share it and enjoy it with my friends from other cultures and religions. I'll give you an example of this. When I was in primary school, every year my parents would organize for me to gift little diyas and sweets to all my classmates every year. My school and most of my friends were Christian, so when I gave them these diyas, it would trigger many wonderful questions of, what is Diwali? Why do you celebrate it? What's the story behind it? Why is Ram important? And then the next day they would tell me how fun it was when they lit the hours with their families that night. In retrospect, I didn't realize the significance of this at the time. My parents' wisdom in helping me share my tradition with the Australian community and also the open-mindedness of my school friends to adopt participate in and be enriched by a tradition that was outside of their culture and religion. So I think this goes to show how the story of Ramayan and Diwali can help people of all cultures unite and connect. So those were my remarks. If Gayatri Anti is back online, I'll pass it back to her to finish her um, remarks. Okay. Okay, now let's try for the second time. <laughs> we need better technology. We'll, we'll, we'll ask for that. Okay, I think I talked about power of 
um, importance of right intent, and then power of delegation. Rama delegated all his tasks to his team members based on their capabilities and strength. Each of the team members were successful in execu executing, but Rama knew who was good for that job. Example, he, he delegated Hanuman to find Sita. And, but he did not send Hanuman as a messenger of peace because he trusted Angadaga as for his negotiation skills. So as a, as a team leader, you should know who to delegate the tasks to. The next one is constant motivation. In spite of having intelligent, powerful leaders in the team, Rama had to take time on a continuous basis to give direction and motivation to the entire team. Without motivation, the best of the leaders can underperform. Another important thing is learn from the enemy. After defeating Ravana, Rama still showed respect towards Ravana and requested Ravana to share his knowledge with him. Ravana obliged and shared all his knowledge with Rama. In today's world, we should respect and seek knowledge from our competitors. There may be many ways we can even collaborate with our co competitors. Just uh, one example of team behavior I would like to mention. Look at the character of Hanuman. Although he was so powerful, he could have easily destroyed Lanka and brought Sita back to Rama. But did he do that? No. He took directions from his team leader. So as a team member, you are your duty is to support your leader to achieve their goals and take and follow directions. So if we ask what is the leadership lesson one can learn, there are several that you can learn from Ramayana, but the one most important one is no compromise on code of conduct and ethics. Integrity of the leader should never be questioned. And, and I came across an interesting uh, Sanskrit verse which talks about the greatness of Ramayana. And I want to share with you that today. Um, I, I'm, this is in Sanskrit. So apologies if I'm not pronouncing it properly. I will do to the best of my ability. Veda, Veda Pare, Pumsi, Jate, Dasharadat Majer. Vedaha, Prasitakshe, Adasita, Sakshat, Ramayana Atmana. I conclude my note by saying Ramayana goes beyond and above the Vedas. What this saying says is Veda, it is Veda. Veda parades goes above the Vedas. Whom see the strength of who? Dasharatha Atmaja, Atmaja, son of Dasharatha. Vedaha, this itself is Veda. Prasteshasa is, is talking about Valmiki, who wrote this text and about Ramayana. So on that note, I would like to finish my presentation. And I hand over, I think Chandrika has done her presentation. Do you have more to contribute? I, I think uh, the other person should start. Okay, so then we move on to Isha, who is a growth manager for HelloFresh. And she's also a student of Bharatanatyam and an active member of Vedanta Society. Over to you, Isha. Uh, Gayatri Auntie, I had finished my remarks when you came from in, so I'll oh. pass it on to Aruna. <laughs> okay, sorry, because I was out. I didn't, I didn't understand what was happening. No worries. <laughs> Apologies. Now we go on to Aruna. Namaste everyone, my name is Aruna um, and as Gayatri said, I have a day job and an evening job now. Uh, I'm a singer and a musician as well as I work for a financial institution. I might start off by answering Shana's question. Can someone explain if Ramayana is a legend or is this something that really existed? Now, unlike the text religions of the book, we can't categorically say that it existed. It's largely mythology. It's a household name. I'm as familiar with Rama as I am with my own family. So his story has been passed on from generations. There are documented books. Um, he's, Rama is the character that myths are made of. There are songs dedicated to him and it's been passed on from generation to generation to generation. But whether there is historic evidence that this person really existed, uh, I would leave that to debate. 
it's very open to debate, but faith can't be questioned, right? And that's where I'll start my, um, my, my context of Ramayana. Ramayana, it's an epic that's captured the imagination of many people around the world. Now, I didn't realize how far it had traversed until I, as a tourist in Cambodia, the tour guide actually said to me, you look just like Sita. And when you're traveling, you don't expect to hear things like that. I, I thought Sita might have been another tourist that he knew. So I said, who's Sita? And he said, oh, Sita from Ramayana. Do you not know Ramayana Sita? Then I realized how far the, the legend of Rama had traveled, so far beyond the shores of Ayodhya. Now, Ramayana at different stages of my life has meant different things to me, okay? But if I have to look at it, okay, as a young child, as a student of music, anyone who learns Indian classical music or dancing knows that a lot of songs are composed exclusively on Rama, especially all the Tagara the Kritis. So there, are, there were a lot of songs on Rama and we were taught to unconditionally sing his praises and he was seen as the God. Okay, so that was in my childhood. As a teenager, everybody would bless us and say, may you get a husband like Rama because Rama was seen as the ideal person. Uh, he only, unlike the other gods in Hindu mythology, he had one wife and he was fiercely loyal to her. But as a teenager, you tend to be a rebel. So my questions were, why do I want a man like Rama? He didn't treat his wife, right? What did he do right? Um, anyone who asks his wife to walk through fire, I don't want a husband like that. Um, someone who banishes his wife from the kingdom, a heavily pregnant wife from the kingdom, I don't want a husband like that. Now, that was in my teenage years. But then as you grow, what you see is that it's not black or white. And you see it in the context of the glorious study of humanity. There's black, there's white, and the many shades uh, between the black and white. And that's what is fascinating about Ramayana. Now, when I look at the behavior of Rama at this stage in my life, um, I can't say that I'm completely convinced that what he did was right, but I can find justification because a person has different roles to play. So Rama was a son to Dasharatha. So he had to listen to his father's command and go into exile for 14 years. He was the wife of, um, he was the husband of Sita. So he had to look after her, but he was also the king of a kingdom. So if he had looked after his wife, he would have made him, his wife and his family happy, but he had a role to play as the ruler of the nation. And I think it even holds valid today. When you become the head of the state, there's far more that you need to look at than your immediate um, circle. Okay, and, and that context, I think Rama was an avatar purusha, purusha. But what I also find fascinating is the study of all the characters. Let's start from Sita. Sita was a very, 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 very strong woman. So there is a legend that she moved the tip of the bow with her little finger while she was playing ball. And this was Shiva's bow. It was supposed to be um, very heavy and beyond the skill of the mightiest of warriors. So if she could push it like that, why couldn't she rescue herself from Lanka when she was held captive? She didn't because she wanted to prove that Rama was, he, he had incarnated, she knew that he had incarnated to establish the victory of good over evil. Hanuman, by the same token, was a very, very strong person. He could leap across the oceans to go to Lanka. Um, but Lakshmana, he left his family. He left everything to follow Rama to the jungle. Why? And when you study all these characters, um, there's always shades of black and white and gray as well. Lakshmana might have been a terrible husband, but his role in the birth, according to legend, was to, to help Rama establish righteousness. So I think the more you delve into the detail of Ramayana, it's not as simple as one might perceive it to be as a superficial reader. There's far more um, layers. There's a, there's a lot more philosophical questions. And that's my take on Ramayana at this grand old age that I am at now. I might hand over to the other panelists. Hi, um, I'm Ayati. I'm pretty sure I'm speaking next. Um, this is my first webinar, so please excuse me if I stutter a lot. Sometimes I forget what I'm about to say next. 
Um, for me, Diwali and Ramayana is a significant festival because it's the first festival that I remember when good triumphed over evil, when Rama um, defeated Ravana. But um, I was seven years old when I first read the book itself. And I didn't think much of it because I was only seven at the time and I read it like it was any other storybook. I didn't analyze any other character. I just read it like a plain storybook. But a couple of years later, when I was a little bit older and I was getting into literary um, analysis, because my English teachers started telling me that you should look for these things in a book, um, I read the Ramayana again. And I realized that they have really important themes about valuing the people who support you. Now, I, when I was in primary school, I used to have these group of friends that I thought they were, my, they were gonna be my best friends for you know, as long as I lived. Um, I was really naive at the time and I realized that they're not actually going to be there any longer because it turns out people change and um, you know, they change and they will go away eventually. And then I remembered the Ramayana one day and then I realized that it, the book has values about friendship where you encounter many people on the way in the course of your life, but not everyone's going to stay. So the people who do stay with you, you should value because you're not going to find many people like that, um, which is a really important one for me because I've been hurt by so many people, you know, whether it was school or someone else I knew from outside because they would change and I would change. But on the way of, um, in the way of this process, I found at least two or three really good friends that I would be with, you know, I think I will be with for quite a long time because they support me through my highs and lows. So um, valuing the people who support you, I feel like that is a really important theme that I learned from this book. And um, this also leads on to another theme which I found in the book, which is that forgiveness is better than revenge. Often when those people would hurt me, I would think about getting revenge on them by doing something equally as stupid as what they did to me. But then once I read the Ramayana, I did realize that it's better to just forgive them because you might have done something wrong as well. And there's no point in harming yourself and the other person in the process. And because Ravana wanted to take revenge on Rama and Lakshman because Lakshman insulted his sister, um, this spontaneous action was what caused his downfall because it led to bad consequences as he was acting before thinking properly, which I admit I have done many times and I still do, and which is a lesson that I have to learn to not get hurt as much. And um, I don't have any other analysis um, of the characters because I, I don't think I would understand any philosophical messages that the Ramayana would give me. So this is all I have right now. And if I do read it again in the future, I'm pretty sure I will find more messages. So now I will hand it over to the next panelist. Thank you, Ayati, for that brilliant analysis uh, from your point of view. So shall we move on to... Badri. You have to unmute yourself, Badri. I'm back. Um, I just wanted to say thanks to Auntie for giving me the opportunity to, to speak in this panel. Um, I read the Ramayana a very, very long time ago, and I had to I had to refresh um, my memory over the over the weekend, but um, from from what I remember from reading the and um, you know reading about the story initially, the one thing that really resonated with me when I read it all those years ago was um, this idea of leadership. And you know, Auntie touched on that um, when she spoke earlier as well. And I guess there are three points um, uh, with regards to leadership that really sort of stuck with me when I read the book the first time. Um, the first is obviously the fact that Rama didn't start out start out as a king, but ended up as a king. Um, whereas Ravana started out as a king and ended up in a position that was far from it. Um, the other thing that, that really was, was, um, was very interesting was the fact that even though Rama lived an ascetic life in the forest, um, he was completely content with the life that he had. And whereas Ravana, even though he lived in a, in a kingdom, he had all those riches and he had a very powerful army and had people around him who um, you know, were able to provide him with advice, um, you know, he still displayed um, had a lot of political clout. He still sort of, um, you know, displayed a lot of greed in his actions by going after 
um, you know, another man's wife. And the, the greed which, which Ravana displays, um, I guess, throughout the story is not um, something that Rama shows once at all um, throughout his life. Um, so that's something that really um, sort of, um, you know, resonated with me when I, when I read that, um, when I um, read the story. The third point, obviously, is just um, integrity. And this was touched on earlier as well, um, because just in order to honor his um, father's word, he was willing to give up his rightful claim to the throne. And um, this, is, this is something that requires uh, uh, a great deal of wisdom, I guess, and, and also a great deal of integrity, which Ravana didn't really show throughout his life and, and also in the story as well. And um, I guess how all of these points are relevant in today's society is that it just sort of demonstrates Rama's life and Rama's style of leadership, I guess, just sort of demonstrates how it's very important to have um, good and noble values. And um, it's the key to, to leading people effectively in today's world. And um, I think that's, that's something that I definitely like to see from, from our leaders. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, thanks for all the panelists. I must say it has been a joy even sitting and listening to all these different perspectives. And uh, I will introduce myself. So my name is Sita. So from day one, uh, my very idealistic father named me Sita because I think he loved Ramayana, he loved the heroine, he loved her qualities. Initially, I have to say, apart from listening to the story, I felt the name was a huge burden because it created an image in India. When I grew up, uh, when you say Sita, it sort of is an automatic image of someone who I don't think I was really. I was a big rebel and I didn't agree with people easily. I love to argue. I wasn't that gentle and quiet and followed my husband in any forestry. But I, like everyone said, I think I look at Ramayana, apart from all the narrations and multiple layers of stories, the essence of Ramayana is still true today because it talks about human behavior, human emotions, human qualities. We talked of ethics, honor, integrity, love, duty, obedience, you know, uh, sacrifice and greed and jealousy, trust, you know, you name it. We have characters to depict those and it sort of brings the story together. And when you look at the today's world, I think we can see all this playing around us in political, in global, in environmental, in every aspect, we have exactly the same. The big oil companies, that's great. You know, there are people with ethics and integrity. They may not get rewarded, but they are great examples. So I think the story is relevant very much today for the way it looks at human behavior and human qualities. So. I think apart from the many other aspects of the story itself and the characters, um, this particular story has got um, such a distinct relevance to throughout our period of history, I think, uh, you know, only slightly the contexts have changed. Um, you, you look at things like, uh, you know, Badri talked about Ravana and Rama and Badri, that was an awesome comparison, I have to say. So Ravana was a great, you know, as a person, he was very well-read. He was very pious. He had wonderful qualities. He was a great warrior. He was a very handsome man. But his greatness was reduced by weaknesses, you know, whether he, whether he coveted another person's wife or he crossed boundaries, which he shouldn't have. So the same way ordinary characters showed great strength and great thing. You know, Lakshmana was a very loving brother, but he made great sacrifices to follow. And, you know, his behavior was absolutely exemplary. Coming to Sita, I would like to sort of finish because Sita has always made a great impact on me viscerally and otherwise. Um, the character of Sita was very interesting. And I think Aruna touched on it very beautifully that when you look at as a very young age, you think, why is she docile? You know, can't she put her foot down? Can't she argue her case? In fact, there are a lot of places where in very modern versions of Ramayana, they say Sita wonders, you know, should she go and tell her father-in-law that 
this is not fair you know i don't want to be a princess or anything but what you're doing is not fair but obviously she doesn't do all that so to me when when i was a teenager and very young when i listened to these stories from my grandparents my parents or my gurus um, you know whether they were music teachers or dance teachers and you know uh, i questioned all this i said you know what this is not good enough you have to put your foot down you got to establish your you know character you should be tough but as i sort of read the story more and more i think that i look at sita as adventurous also so here was a princess who was told when he went on exile you're too good just stay here and she argues with him i think in kambaramayana in a very beautiful poetry she says you promised me when you married me you'll always look after you how can you look after me when you are somewhere in the forest and i'm in the palace you know there will be so many intrigues and also she said i want to share every adventure with you literally so she off she went so she was not that coy you know subservient person so she wanted to share the adventures and then when you look at the end of a story where we rama had all this you know he told her you have to go away she's fully pregnant with twins but she's banished here we have a very modern example of this princess who has done everything possible going to the forest and bringing up her twins on her own does it ring a bell in modern times there are women you know who go through a lot of lot of trajectories and they come out brilliantly and they establish their character they establish their importance in society and they shine as an example so and one can talk about this forever frankly and uh, sam really knows that i love this subject so she'll stop me with her stopwatch i think any minute now but i think the story there are so many things to learn from mythologies and story and then there were questions about is this just a legend is it real far 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 time back there was a real character but each storyteller has embellished the story a little bit more so that it's come out you know the characters have become really black or really white uh, and then we have to really read between like uh, dr chandrika said to different nuances in the stories but i think these mythologies these narrations and oral histories whether it is hindu mythology greek or the dream time stories are extremely important to a modern life to my and these young generations who are coming after us for us to learn for us to learn examples to say what not to do and to look at it with much more introspection and not be you know superfluously looking at anything and we can understand the modern politics environment and you know all the other issues which plague us sometimes and we can think back and look at these kind of mythologies and maybe learn some lessons from them so i also want to conclude saying there's a very modern book it's called sita actually and this is written by a canadian indian author is called chitra divakaruni chitra banerji divakaruni in this book sita is portrayed as very differently so it, it there was a lot of controversy in india and people are very upset because she's not portrayed as this very ideal coy following five footsteps behind never doing anything wrong person she's very real she's very live she's a woman um she's got her own ideas she's an environmentalist she's a healer so i urge you all to read this because it gives you a totally different thinking about these characters um and i think that's why these stories are important and i want uh, you know young people like uh, isha ayati badri and all you scholars to look at these stories and mythologies and continuously interpret them as we grow older we are in different stages of life and there's so much so much to learn and i do thank gayatri for putting this together and giving this opportunity she's awesome i can tell you that i work with her every day thank you i like to make a comment because there was a in the chat session somebody asked why did ram question sita's integrity when she was kidnapped and yet not touched you know mm. i want to just um react to that not actually answer that question because that's been debated in various uh, forums mm. and i had an interesting chat with one of my friends who is a medical doctor by profession and she was 
talking about some scientific evidence. She said, you know, with uh, I can I have scientific evidence that you know when it could be why why did Rama ask Sita to walk through fire? Why did he do it? Because when Rama went and got Sita from Lanka after going through all those hardships, he realized that she was not the Sita he knew. It was not the same person. So you use electric shock in uh, to treat people. So it's like a shock therapy, she said. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm just yeah. bringing yeah. that to the board but we, and say it's an interesting um, uh, line to think about as well. And the other thing that she was saying is, yes, um, the question uh, that Rama, uh, as a leader, as a king, you know, he never reacted to situations that happened. It was, he only responded. So as a ruler, he had this, um, this oh, what do you say, the burden of carrying, you know, uh, protecting his people, protect, protecting his family and, you know, leading them. So he, uh, it's, it's, it's very nice to know that he responded and not reacted to situations which is, which is different. If you react, then you can't respond or you cannot act. So he responded to situations. So that's a good strength in his character, I thought. And I, it was a very um, good interpretation of, you know, medical interpretation of mm. shock therapy. And I said, oh, I never heard that for, uh, you know, that's a new interpretation I'm hearing. And, and then uh, it's, not that, about... it's, it's not that different now either. Even if you look at the presidential elections now, um, each person's integrity and the integrity of their mm. family is debated and questioned all yeah. the time. So it's not. That's so, right. so I think the, the, the point was that he knew that his wife would come through the fear, uh, fire completely unscathed, but he just wanted to uh, stop that line of questioning from the people in his kingdom. Uh, that's the, the actual explanation. Given there. And I also want to say that, you know, um, when you step back and read these stories, yes, in Indian context, context when I grew up, like I think Dr. Chandrika said it, it, many of the many of the cohorts looked at it as a very religious thing and he was worshipped as a god. But I look at these characters as more human. And I think he was great. He was very idealistic. He had fantastic, just like Ravana was a great character, but he had these weaknesses. It's perfectly allowed for every human being to have doubts and, you know, sometimes make the split second choices, which you at the time think is perfectly okay. And it's got consequences, then you're going to explain. Mm -hmm. So here was a great king, you know, and he took on board and he, he took that suffering on. But I personally, I don't like to idolize any character to an extent where we want them to be always on top of the pedestal and they cannot make any mistake. I would rather look at characters as ho in whole, I guess, where there are, you know, they have got a lot of good things. They may have little ch weaknesses, but we still love them. We still love these characters. So there is an I, I would like to One add, more. sorry. sorry. Yeah. I would like to add something to this. He has created all the characters hmm. uh, in a very equal status. Like yeah. Ravana has got all his good qualities, yeah. except this One. taking yeah. away Sita. Hmm. The same way he has created Bali and all the other characters, even though hmm. people think they are bad, it's yeah. well balanced to show yeah. a yeah. man or a human being as all qualities within them. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the qualities are just exposed when they are emotional hmm. or due to some other circumstances. So that way, Valmiki or Kamban or anyone who has followed Valmiki has created the characters as it's well balanced. Even Ravan and Raman has got a weakness because when Surpanage comes and asks him to get married to him, he says, if you have come to me through your brothers, I would have married you. But you came alone mm -hmm. and asked me, I can't marry you. Whereas he has told Sita, I will not even think about any other woman in this world. Uh, uh, to prove is, uh, they say that uh, Raman always has one, sparrow, one arrow, one uh, wife and one... Um, word. So to prove that he has always been thinking that Raman is uh, with one wife, but whereas he has expressed that elsewhere in the epic, that if Surpanaya has been introduced by his own brothers, 
or his family has asked for her marriage, he would have agreed for that. So it is it, how the characters are built are with all goods and bads, or all the evils and good things. And unless you read it in depth, you won't understand what is underlying or underpinning theme of that. Righteousness yep. is the main thing that Ramayana is trying to establish in all his characters. There is a I, I question. would like to share. There I would like to Sorry. share a comment that somebody has made the earlier on. Um, it, towards the beginning in Valmiki Ramayan, this is explained that it is history told in story form. So it is actually up to interpretation as to which part is fact and which part is embellishment of storytelling. However, it is clearly not entirely fiction either. And that evidence is also within Valmiki Ramayana itself and can be found to this state over the country, including outside of India. So, well, yes, there are various forums that are talking about whether Ramayana is a story or whether it's mythology or whether it's actually history, but we're not going there. We just, whether it's a story or is it, it's a history, what are we learning from it and how we are connecting to it is what we are looking at today. Absolutely. I don't so there's, know. A question, there's a question from uh, Matt and he asks, when you travel, especially in Thailand, Indonesia, Ramayana is interwoven into culture and mythology. What's your view on why Ramayana spread so far and wide and why it entered into different cultures? Uh, my, my take on that is, in those days, um, bilateral relations between countries were established through trade. Uh, the Chora, um, Chera and Pandya dynasties had flourishing trade with every country in that region. Um, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, and that's how the cultural ties were established. And that's why you find commonalities between Hinduism in, um, and Buddhism relevance to those religions. And, and you know, the Angkor Wat the temple mm -hmm. is a classic example. And, and that's, that's why, because we, we built in those days, we, I believe that we built relations through trade, which we should do more of now, I think. I agree. And there is one more, I totally agree. One more, uh, there is a comment from um, saying that, uh, you know, isn't Ramayana a story that Ravana only kidnapped Sita as retribution to what happened between Lakshmana and Ravana's sister Supanaka? At a very base level, yes, that's only one thing. But in the many regional Ramayanas, there are, I'm told, that, I don't know, hundreds of different versions of Ramayana. One very basic thing says it was destiny. That's how, you know, these characters were created to get rid of evil over whatever. But it is also, I think, not just retribution. It is also that if you look at the character of Sita again, you know, when Ra Ra uh, Rama and Lakshmana go to get this deer, which she's absolutely fascinated and she wants it. They, she's told very clearly, it's not, it, it's just magic. Don't fall for it. You'll be in danger, but she's absolutely, she wants it. So they go. So before they go, Lakshmana draws a little boundary and say, don't cross it. There's absolute danger. Do not cross this boundary. You know, but she does. She does. So again, these characters establish, I think, that we all have our weaknesses. We all have desires, you know, and sometimes at the base of a thing, when we are taking an action, we may know. This is not going to come out very well, but we still do it, right? I think these stories are very much about that kind of a thing. Rama should know really better than to tease Surpanaka. Like that question Dr. Chandrika said was that both the brothers are having a bit of a fun and teasing her. Well, you know, he should have known better than that, but it was just fun they had. But it had such a deep impact on Surpanaka that she's absolutely, you know, wounded by this teasing. So we talked about, you know, IT talked about, you know, a context. So this teasing was so cruel. And it was done by two princesses who were exemplary characters, who were ideal. Everybody worshipped them, but it still happened. They have the weakness. So off she went. So maybe Ravana is protecting his sister's honor. So what is right and wrong becomes extremely an interesting question. And that is why Ramayana to me and Mahabharata, of course, are fascinating stories because the more you read, I think there's a definition of classic is the more you read and the depending on your stage, you read it, 
you find more depth and meaning to it. And I think Ramayana is a great example of that. Aruna, you wanted to say something? No, I think I already addressed it. Yeah. It was Matt's question. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's also a comment saying there are also stories where Sita is supposed to be Ravana's daughter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, there are yeah, yes, various stories. Yeah. Many, many, many. I think this is where these, that's what I mean by mythologies and stories of ancient cultures. You cannot look at them in a one dimensional story format. I think there is so much depth and so much history. Like every storyteller will add and embellish their own perspective of the story and it passes on. So my grandmother's idea of Sita was quite different to my mother's. Mine is totally different. My daughter's is different. My little granddaughter argues with me about these stories. Her idea of why Sita is beautiful or good, or, you know, why, you know, uh, Ravana did this or didn't that. So I think therein lies the interest in these stories. But the legend lives on. That's correct. Absolutely. <laughs> It'll always live on. Classic. Thank you. Okay, now I was looking at a question from, did we answer this question from Anthony Lim? Is that what you answered, Aruna? No. So there is comment, Bali is mainstream destination of Aussies, or Aussies aware that Hindu is the main religion in Bali and have temples devoted to Hindu gods. He commented, he comments in Java, there is a major Hin, Hindi temple, the from. Prambanan built in the 8th century BC, more than 1,300 years ago, and a performance each year in June and July. I think definitely I've heard about these and they're still discovering in, even in Angkor Wat, wherever all these South Asian regions, they're still discovering ancient temples and this, you know, influence of Hinduism in all those Southeast Asian countries. Uh, Bali is very interesting. To answer his question, do the average Aussie who goes to the beach and who enjoys, do they know about Hinduism? Maybe at that stage, they're not questioning their surround so much. Um, but I think these kind of panel discussions will definite, definitely start a conversation. Yep. It's all because of Chola dynasty, which yeah. uh, really ruled the Southeast Asian countries mm -hmm. and companies from Chola dynasty. So it was pampered by, or took, uh, by uh, the, uh, the kings. So that yeah. it, when, wherever they went, they built the temples and they mm -hmm. also spread their culture there. Yeah. So that's how this must have gone to the entire Southeast Asia. And they must, it, it must have modified time to time according to their culture and stuff. And if you see Sita, Sita will not be like Aruna in um, uh, where Angkor Wat or from maybe in Angkor Wat she looked like Aruna, but in some other parts of the Southeast Asia she must be different. So uh, it is the mythology and the um, uh, stories and stuff which really get mo uh, modified according to mm. their culture and stuff. Yep. So and I, there's also a suggestion that uh, it's been a wonderful experience. We should do this for other stories such as Mahabharata and Krishna stories. Yes, I do agree there. <laughs> I'm very partial to those stories. And I also like to say, to some of the audience who are not 100% uh, cognizant of this, that in, in India, the Ramayana story was depicted not as an oral narration. It came through music. It came through dance. It came through storytelling, you know, on live stage. We called it Harikatha. So it came and then, of course, like puppeteries and other street theater. So for most of people from Indian ethnic origin, this story is like a little background of our lives. Uh, There's also a request to, to for Aruna to end the session with a song from Aruna since, since she's a singer, if we have time. <laughs> I just had a few uh, thoughts. Um, yep. Very interesting yeah, sure, go. analysts. I think we covered one was um, how factually correct is this document? And to that, I would respond as Aruna said, things are not black and white. There's a whole lot of gray in the middle. So things are not completely fact. Things are not completely false. Please find where you sit on the spectrum in between without dismissing either extremity. 
Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is one comment men made here is how the story of Ramayana has spread to other cultures. And I think this really shows how the ancient world was a lot more connected mm. than we would believe. So growing up in Australia, a lot of our education was very Eurocentric. It was the source of progress, of social progress, of scientific progress, of literature, and of an advanced society it was all very Eurocentric. But when we see these documents, when we see the share of knowledge outside of Europe between different cultures, I think we see a very different picture. So this is another reason I think people should explore Ramayana as well, as it will give you a bit of a complementary perspective on what else was doing going around in the world. And I think there was also some mention given to Ram's character, um, how good he was as a person. And my reading on that is, these days, there's a lot of conversation around toxic masculinity, that a lot of male characters in our books are very aggressive, always have to be right, have to be the most powerful, James Bond, always fighting, always getting the women. And I think the character of Ram is such a refreshing change to this. He is someone, yes, he had his battles, but what he is known for is his kindness, his sensitivity, his forbearance. So. I think I would end with that note as well, where in the age of feminism, we're thinking about what the role is of a woman and we're also thinking about what the role is of a man. And let's come away of, from these very aggressive male heroes and think about kindness and gentleness as good qualities. So that, those were my reflections, but thank you so much. for Well for said, opinion. well said, Isha. Well. Beautifully well spoken, yeah. Um, I would also like to add that um, if the attendees want to share their reflections, they can put their hand up to share. Mm. We close with a song from Aruna and then I'll let anyone who has their hand up um, speak after that. Okay. Do you want me to sing now? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. So I thought um, just as um, Isha was talking, I was thinking, okay, what's the best song to sing for this audience? There's a beautiful song um, by Tulsi Das where Rama is described as a little baby taking tiny steps, crawling. So I thought I'd finish with the memory of Rama as a little baby, happy baby, rather than burdened by all the pressures of the world. Ramachand Bhajat Tanjaniya Tumak Chalak Ramachand Bhajat Tanjaniya Tumak Chalak Ramachand Kilaki Kilaki Uthat Daya Girat Bhumilat Pataya Daya Mat Godalet Daya Mat Godalet Dasharat Iraniya Chumat
चलत राम चंद्र वेरी नाइस थैंक यू thank you aruna and thank you all for being part of this discussion it was very interesting and i have learned so much and i hope our audience enjoyed as well thank you thank you thank, thank you everyone. everyone thank you so much we have one member of the audience um can you talk hello Okay, well thank you so much everybody. Um please stay in touch. Um and we'll send you um any details um of the chat or any future events. Thank you Sam. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you Gayatri. Thank you Sam. Thank you everyone. See you Thank all. you guys three. Thank you Sita. Bye. Bye, Bye Sam. Thank you Sita. Hi. Lovely to meet you all.